You guys fired up here? Well, guys, uh, you know, every time we take missions contributions, it seems like there's a little anxiety in the room. I know everybody really wants to know how well we did with raising our missions contribution money. And I just want you to know that Harvey just handed me a piece of paper right here with our total amount given. You guys want to know what it is? You got to wait till the end of service. Let's, uh, let's begin this morning with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we're so humbled to come before you. Uh, God, we know that uh, none of us uh, are anything, God. We're, we're but dust. And who are we that you should be mindful of us? Who, sh- who are we that you should care about us, God? Who are we that you should pay attention to us each and every day? God, it's so great to come together as your family, to be able to study your word together. God, I pray that through the scriptures you inspire us, God. Father, that you encourage those that need encouragement, that you challenge and call us higher if we need to be called higher. God, I pray that all of us in walking out this morning, God, will have changed in some way. And God, I pray that the scripture will just continue to move in our hearts as we go on throughout the week. Father, we thank you so much for this time. We love you more than life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Have you ever found yourself saying or doing the wrong thing at the wrong time? (laughs) You know, I don't know if you've ever been in a movie and you start talking and you're just kind of talking because the movie's loud and then all of a sudden the sound just drops out. And you're the only guy in the movie theater talking really loud. Have you guys ever had one of those awkward moments? Or perhaps you're in your car and a good song comes on and you start dancing and then you think nobody's watching. And then all of a sudden you look over and the car next to you is just looking at you laughing. Or maybe you're, you're eating something off the floor. You know, I don't know if anybody's ever done that before or at least you will, uh, that you'll publicly admit to Lou. But you eat something off the floor and you think nobody's watching, and then you look up and somebody's staring right at you and they're looking at you. You know, it encourages me to find that Jesus often did things or said things that were deemed in his time as being inappropriate. Now that said, Jesus was perfect. And he never really did the wrong thing. When Jesus did something, Although it may have seemed inappropriate, it was always appropriate. The title of our lesson this morning is When It's Appropriate to Be Inappropriate. Let's go to John chapter 4. You know, right here in this story, I I find a lot of things that Jesus does that I think many would consider even today as being very seemingly inappropriate. And yet, once again, it's Jesus. And Jesus never did the wrong thing. And so sometimes... It's appropriate to do things that seem inappropriate. In John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, we find right here the story of a Samaritan woman and Jesus. It says, Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about noon. When the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Would you give me something to drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. You know, right here we find, as Jesus is traveling from Judea to Galilee, the Bible records that he had to travel through Samaria. Samaria was not his ideal place to travel through. In fact, many of the Jews did not have a good relationship with the Samaritans. And so he he passes through Samaria because it was in between Judea and Galilee. And he gets through Samaria at around noon, and needless to say, he was quite tired. I mean, if you were traveling from one city to another city by foot, even though you're Jesus, you're going to get tired. You with me? And so he stops to take a break at this well, considered Jacob's well, or some would say it's the well of Sychar. 
And all of a sudden, the Samaritan woman comes out to draw water in the well. And Jesus just looks at her and says, hey, give me some water. Now, many people, I think, would say, man, you could be a little bit more polite, Jesus. I mean, there's no hello. Like, hi, how you doing? Would you be able to give me some water, please? There's not even a please. I mean, it seems just kind of rude. Like, hey, woman, give me some water. And yet... Jesus never did anything that was inappropriate. He always did the right thing. And so sometimes it's appropriate to be inappropriate. In fact, there's much more about the situation that is actually seemingly inappropriate. Number one, this was Jesus, a rabbi, speaking to a woman. You don't really think much of it at this day, but at this time, it was strictly forbidden for a rabbi to speak to a woman in public. Wow, really? In fact... Uh, Women were were sort of looked down upon in society. It was even quoted at that time by a lot of the rabbis. Better the words of the law be burned than given to a woman. Whoa. Whoa. Now, Jesus had a very radical perspective on women, and he treated women in a very awesome way. In fact, Jesus had his following of women just like he had his following of men. And they were both equal in his sight. You with me? But, But yet, at this time, it would have been considered inappropriate for Jesus to talk to this woman. Number two, and she even draws upon this, he was a Jew and she was a Samaritan. Samaritans were half Assyrian, half Jewish. And so those that were Jewish despised the Samaritans because the Assyrians were Jewish enemies. You with me right here, guys? And they looked at the Samaritans as being, quote, half-breeds. And so right here, this whole conversation seems to be inappropriate. It's just not what should happen at this time. But this is Jesus. And nothing Jesus does is ever inappropriate. When it's appropriate to be inappropriate. Point number one, who are you with? Who are you with? You know, here we find (coughs) that this woman is already weirded out by Jesus. Like, Jesus, who are you? I mean, you're not even supposed to be talking to me right now. She goes, you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. I mean, what, what are you doing? But now Jesus takes it even further. Let's keep reading right here in verse 10. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with and the well is quite deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself? As it also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, okay, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you said you have no husband. The fact is that you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you've just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Let's stop right there. I mean, this is getting quite inappropriate. This is getting very weird. You with me? I mean, you ever have a conversation with somebody, and it just kind of takes a turn for the worse? You're just like trying to figure out a way out right there. Like, okay, how do I get out of this situation? Like, I'm so sorry. i got to go use the restroom. I mean, it's just, what do you do? And yeah, here's Jesus. (coughs) He's talking to this woman. He goes, if you knew who was asking you for a drink, you'd have asked and I would have given you living water. He goes, living water? Well, dude, you you don't even have a bucket to draw with. He goes, yeah, but you know, I'm not really talking about a physical water. I'm more talking about a spiritual water that's going to sustain you and fill you up. She goes, well, give me this water because I don't want to keep on having to come back out to this well and draw water. You see, she still wasn't quite getting what Jesus was trying to offer her. And Jesus' response says, well, okay, just, just go call your husband. I think at this point, her heart just drops. She goes, well, I don't, I don't have a husband. He goes, well, that's true. You've had five, and the guy that you're currently with, you're not married to. Whoa. You know, guys, today we, we live in an age of political correctness. You with me right here, guys? 
I mean, you can't even spank your kids, much less talk about somebody's failed marriages and be politically correct. In fact, uh, just a few weeks ago, I don't know if you guys watch a lot of sports, but one of the quarterbacks in NFL football got in big trouble because he made a comment about a woman. That it was funny hearing statistics from a woman in his perspective. And it's huge backlash. I mean, could you imagine the backlash that Jesus, a public figure, would have gotten for going to this level with this woman right here? And yet it's Jesus. Jesus is Jesus. He's perfect. He never says the wrong thing or does the wrong thing. Even though it seems inappropriate, nothing could be more appropriate. Because sometimes it's appropriate to be inappropriate. You go, well, why would Jesus say something like this? Well, I don't think he was trying to be rude. I don't think he was trying to be discriminatory or even condescending. But his question, I think, really exposed her character. That she had been looking for something to fill her up in life. And she was going from guy after guy and relationship after relationship, looking for something to fill up that void in her heart, and nothing was working. And he goes, I've got something for you, living water, that's going to fill you up. Who are you with? Who are you with? You know, there's actually something a little bit deeper to the story. Let's look over in 2 Kings chapter 17. Come on, bro. Wow. Remember, she is a Samaritan woman. Yes. You guys with me right here, or are you still thinking about this piece of paper I've got in my Bible? <laughs> it's right here, guys. I'm not going to tell you what's on the other I side. Oh, that was close. <clears throat> oh. <coughs> Second Kings, chapter 17. You know, sometimes when you read the scriptures, it's helpful to know the historical background of a certain city or of a certain people. And right here, the Bible actually describes how Samaria was founded. And uh, we know that in 722 BC, the Assyrians came in and took into captivity the majority of all of Israel. (coughs) Right here, the king of Assyria decides to resettle Samaria in Israel. Okay, so let's pick it up right here in 2 Kings 17, verse 24. Keep in mind that this woman was a Samaritan. Let's see if we find any similarities here. It says, the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and Sepharvaim, and settled them in the towns of Samaria to replace the Israelites. Let's stop there. So here the king of, king of Assyria goes, okay, we want to resettle Samaria, so we're going to send people from five different peoples. So he goes through and he goes, okay, Babylon, Kutha, Abba, Hamath, and Sepharvam. So he sends people from five different nations. Okay, just keep that in mind, five different nations. Verse 25. When they first lived there, they did not worship the Lord. So God sent lions among them, and they killed some of the people. Whoa, it's never going to work out good if you don't worship God. Amen? It was reported to the king of Assyria. The people you deported and resettled in the towns of Samaria do not know what the God of that country requires. He has sent lions among them, which are killing them off because the people do not know what he requires. Then the king of Assyria gave this order. Have one of the priests you took captive from Samaria, so a priest of God, go back to live there and teach the people what the God of the land requires. So one of the priests who had been exiled from Samaria came to live in Bethel and taught them how to worship the Lord. Isn't that pretty awesome right there? Verse 29. Nevertheless, each national group made its own gods in the several towns where they settled and set them up in the shrines the people of Samaria had made at the high places. The people from Babylon made Sukkoth Banath, those from Kutha made Nergal, and those from Hamath made Ashima, the Alvites made Nibha and Tartak, and the Servavites burned their children in the fire as sacrifice to Adrimelech and Anemelech, the guards of Sepharvaim. They worshipped the Lord, but they also appointed all sorts of their own people to officiate for them as priests in the shrines of the high places. They worshipped the Lord, but they also served their own gods in accordance with the customs of the nations, from which they had been brought. Whoa! What's happening right here? As these five nations go back into Samaria, they bring with them their five gods. Remember that number five right there? Five gods, five husbands. They were committed to worshiping all of those gods, 
And then, yeah, there was also the real God with the priest of God back in Samaria. And so they're worshiping all these gods, and they have a, a fake commitment with the real God. Wow. Sound familiar? Yeah, here's this woman. She's married to five guys, and then the guy she's with, she's not really married to. Who are you with? Who are you with? Are you really committed to the Lord? You know, right here, I think Jesus finds this woman in a life situation. Genuinely, she did have five husbands. And genuinely, she was with somebody that she was not really with. You with me? But I think her situation represented all of Samaria. They had this superficial relationship with the true God. And all the while, the people worshipped all these other gods. Who are you with? Who are you with? You know, the only way to experience living water is to be with the true God. To be truly committed. You know, it's, it's, it's funny. This past week, uh, I'm a huge Cleveland Cavalier basketball fan. Come on, Isaiah. Come on, Isaiah. And I, I know that there's some persecutors in the church. Amen. Come on, Isaiah. <clears throat> you know, I, I believe in positive vibes, so I won't go there, but Amen. <laughs> And uh, this past week, I, I happened to catch the highlights of LeBron and the Cavaliers beating the Wizards. And LeBron scored 57 points. Whoa. I mean, incredible game. In doing so, he became the youngest ever to score 29,000 points. I mean, that's pretty cool. And he's actually one year younger than me. So he's my age, and he's still in the NBA, and he's cranking. But to become the youngest player ever, he had to pass Kobe Bryant. Oh. And then I got to thinking about it. I go, here's this guy, Kobe. His whole life is all about basketball. He's achieved a lot in doing it. But now that he's retired, there's somebody younger who's passed him by, and in a few years, nobody's going to even remember Kobe Bryant. Wow. Right. It's so sad that so many people have a life purpose that is completely and utterly pointless. Wow. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9 says, What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. You're nothing special. There is nothing new under the sun. So many people stake their life on accomplishing something or achieving something, and they really think that they're going to make a difference in the world. Wow. But I promise you, unless you're committed to the true God, your life is going to be pointless, meaningless. James 4.14 says, what is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. That's it. Just a little. You guys ever play with those little air fresheners like... You know, we use the washroom or whatever. Just, I mean, just that little mist comes out. And you know, when that mist comes out, it smells good for just a moment. And then it fades away. That's, that's, that's our lives. And if we're not basing our lives on something that matters, living water, it's pointless. I mean, who are you with? You know, there's a bumper sticker that <coughs> says, he who dies with the most toys wins. And isn't that the purpose of so many people's lives? Just to accumulate wealth, to accumulate stuff and junk. But you know, the problem is, he who dies with the most toys still dies. <laughs> you still die. What a futile existence. What a purposeless life. You know, I, I get a chance to talk to a lot of college students. And one of the questions I ask is, hey, what are you doing in college? Well, you know, I, I really want to get a good education. Why? Well, uh, now that I think about it, I don't really know. I guess, I guess I really want to get a good job. Okay. Why? Well, I want to make a lot of money. Why? Why do you want to make a lot of money? 
Because then I can experience the life that I want. I can have a family that I can support and I can have security and comfort. Why? Because I guess then I can be happy. I go, do you know that the secret to happiness has nothing to do with those things? But has everything to do with a relationship with God. Who are you with? Who are you with? Really? I remember this sister in Honolulu. Guy started hitting on her, and she was a disciple. And he goes, hey, do you have a boyfriend? She goes, no, I'm married to Jesus. Don't mess with me. Who are you really with? Who are you really with? You know, when you're with somebody, like you're really with somebody, it's obvious. Wow. Yeah, everybody knows who Jake's married to. Sits next to her at church and even during the service they make googly eyes at each other. <laughs> everybody knows Jake and Megan are married. That's right. I mean, it's obvious. Jake is with Megan and Megan is with Jake. Amen. 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 There is a God. <laughs> Everybody knows who Tony's with. (coughs) Nobody questions it. And of course, they know because nobody else could handle Tony. Thank God for Vita. Who are you with? Who you're with is obvious, or it's not. Sometimes it's appropriate to be inappropriate. And I think Jesus right here with this woman is really trying to get her to see your life has been so purposeless. But I've got something for you that's better. But instead of going and marrying all these guys, come and have a real relationship with God, who you're with. Number two, what are you doing? (laughs) What are you doing? Have you ever been asked that question before? Yes. My dad asked me that question a lot. Son, what are you doing? I remember one time he had this little putter. You remember those little things that you put into and then they shoot the ball back? Yes. Well, he had this putter that broke, and so me and my little brother thought it would be a good idea to take it apart. So we're taking it apart and looking at all the wires. I'm like, whoa, this is so cool. But it still had that little thing, that little plug that you plug into the socket. Of course, we're young kids. It's like, man, I wonder what it would look like like this, open, plugged in. So we plug it in, and, and we noticed that when we touched two little wires together, there was like a really cool blue spark. So we're just like, whoa, whoa. And my dad walks in, he goes, what are you doing? <laughs> See, sometimes you just get to ask that question, what are you doing? Yeah. Let's go back to John chapter 4, verse 19. Come on, bro. Hey. Who are you with, and what are you doing? John 4, verse 19. Sir, the woman said, I, I can see that you're a, a prophet. You know, I mean, you know intimate details about my life that I've never told you about, so you must be from God. Verse 20. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. What are you doing? We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Wow, that sounds like a cut right there. Wow. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, I'm sure he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Whoa. Poof. Whoa. This is incredible. I mean, here this woman is, and she's, she's already blown away. Jesus is telling her all about herself. I mean, that's got to be pretty convicting. Man, this guy knows everything I've done. This is scary. And she goes, well, you know, uh, you guys believe that you're supposed to worship in Jerusalem. Well, us Samaritans, well, we, we kind of have a different perspective on where we should worship. And specifically, what she was referring to is Mount Gerizim. Because as the Israelites were released from exile in Babylon to rebuild Jerusalem, there were already Samaritans that had been settled there from Assyria. And they couldn't worship at the temple because there was no temple. And so they built themselves their own little temple on Mount Gerizim. Of course, this was not a temple of God. 
This is just an empty building that they made them feel better about their religion. You with me right here, guys? Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I remember um, one time in San Diego, we were, we were building a church there. And we wanted to start a campus ministry on one of the campuses, a very prestigious school uh, called University of San Diego. It's a totally private school. It's a Catholic school. And so we were spying out the campus and walking around and praying in different spots with the campus leaders that we wanted to lead that college. And uh, we came up upon this, this huge cathedral. I mean, it's incredible. And so we walked in and tried to open the door, and the door was locked. So we walked around the side of the building. We found an open door in the back. We're like, we got to check this thing out. So we walked through the back, and I mean, this thing was incredible. I mean, just huge arch ceilings. I mean, stained glass windows everywhere. Just rows and rows and rows of pews for people to sit on. And then there are these, these steps that kind of led up the front. And at the top of the stairs was this, like, throne-looking chair. I mean, it looked like a court that a king would have back in the day. And so we're just walking around. We're just so blown away by this building. And all of a sudden, we hear this guy come. He goes, hey, guys, what are you doing here? We go, oh, I'm so sorry. We didn't know we couldn't be in here. We were just kind of looking around, and we, we saw this, this room here. He goes, oh, yeah, this is our great cathedral and this and that. I go, oh, okay, is this where you guys have church? He goes, no, nah, we don't use this for church. We use this other building down the way. I mean, here you have this huge building, beautiful, and nobody even uses the church building for church. Wow. Isn't this how so much mainstream Christianity has become? Wow. Empty religion. Wow. Nobody actually using things for what they were created. Nobody uses the Bible for what the Bible was intended for. Yeah. Nobody goes to church for what church was intended for. On, they just go there to feel better about themselves. And here this woman, a Samaritan, was amidst his people. That even created their own temple. They felt great about their relationship with God. But it just they didn't even know what they were doing. What are you doing? Well, Jesus goes on and he goes, well, you know, time is coming where it's not really about where you worship. It's really about how you worship. You see, there's, there's true worshipers, and if there's true worshipers, then there, there must be false worshipers. And he goes, true worshipers are worshipers who worship in spirit and in truth. Go, that's awesome. Now I know what it takes to be a true worshiper. You know, a lot of people have debated what that phrase means, to worship in spirit and in truth. Well, it's very simple. Now, I love how the Bible is very simple. Okay. You know, it's, it doesn't take a PhD to follow the Bible. Doesn't that fire you guys up? I mean, anybody can read the Bible and be blown away by what the Bible teaches. Now, of course, there are more complicated issues. But as far as what you really know to be a Christian, it's very simple. Difficult, but simple. You with me? Yeah. And, uh, you know, even in the Bible, spirit and truth is just simple. Doing the right things, truth, with the right heart, yeah. spirit. That's it. You see, you can, you can do all the right things and have a wicked, bad attitude about it. Yeah. And you can have a great attitude and be completely genuine like this woman right here, but be doing all the wrong things. You with me? You know, for me, I I remember uh, as a young married, and I know this is hard to believe because many of you know my wife, who sadly today is sick at home with my son, who's also sick, so please be praying for her. But uh, my wife, of course, is an angel, and so it's it's almost unbelievable that my wife and I could get into a fight. (laughs) Uh, It happens. And particularly when we were a young marriage, we got into a lot of fights. But there's two specific fights that really stand out to me. I remember this one time, uh, you know, things had been happening in our marriage, and there were some unresolved issues. And you know when there are some unresolved issues in your marriage, every little thing becomes an issue. Yeah. And so these little things kept bothering Kelly. And, and really the, 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 the straw that broke the camel's back is when I went over and she was doing dishes, and I, I put my dirty dish in her dish soap. So the brother's are like, what? The women are like, oh, Yeah. And she turned at me and she says, would you stop it? And she started yelling at me. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> well, you know, I thought about it for a second. And I really wanted to do the right thing. And I know the man's supposed to lead according to the Bible. Oh, okay. So I walked back into the room after my wife just toasted it with all these like anger coming at me. And I walked back in and I said, woman, you will respect me. <laughs> Next thing I know, there's a spatula flying in my direction. 
Now, to this day, she swears she didn't actually throw the spatula at me. She threw it at the wall, and it bounced off the wall towards me. All I know is that spatula was a line drive for my face. Luckily, it just barely missed me. But, you know, I, I really thought that that was the right thing to do in that moment. In my heart of hearts, I believe that was the best thing. And I might not have done the wrong thing, but, but I had the right heart. You with me right here, guys? In another fight, <coughs> I promise we have a great marriage now. And been married for 12 years, and so these are the first couple of years here. In another fight, and you know, it's just we're getting into, getting into it about small little things and couldn't get resolved. And so uh, two days went by, three days went by. You know how it is when you don't get resolved. Every time you get home, it's just miserable. There's, there's an awkwardness because you're both mad at each other, but nobody really wants to deal with it, so you just have this angry standoff, just like. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Nothing. I mean, just, just a standoff, just an angry standoff. So this is going on for several days, and of course we're both just miserable because we're in sin. Go to midweek that night and walked into church, and I thought I was putting on a pretty good front, but everybody could see, no, this guy's really struggling. <laughs> My face just downcast, and I'm just bitter and angry. Church gets over, and the guy who was discipling me at the time pulls me aside. He goes, bro, what's going on? You look terrible. No, I don't. I'm fine, bro. He goes, no, bro, you look terrible. What's happening? I go, well, you don't, you don't know what it's like to be married to this evil woman, bro. I just... <laughs> I mean, it's like Satan has really gone into my wife. Bro, she just does not respect me. She does not submit to my leadership and blah, 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 blah. He goes, bro, stop. Bro, there's more. He goes, bro, just stop. Before you go home tonight, I want you to stop at the store and buy flowers for your wife. I go, bro, are you kidding me? My wife is possessed by the devil. She does not deserve flowers. I will not stop and buy flowers. That would be like me giving in to her attitude. I'm not going to let that happen. He goes, bro, stop. Now, this guy was a former master chief in the military. So when he got serious, I went, yes, sir. <laughs> he goes, bro, stop. Stop at the store on the way home. Get your wife some flowers. Go home and just see what happens. All right. So I, I, I went to the store and I stopped. Of course, I went to the discount aisle in the flowers section. <laughs> I got to be honest, I, I went for the, the cheapest flowers I could find. I was still so angry. Went back home and opened the door, and, and, and who should be right there in front of the door when I got home but my wife? She sees the flowers, she goes, oh, babe, I'm so sorry. Immediate resolved. <laughs> <laughs> now, at that point, she didn't know I had a bad attitude about getting the flowers. But you see, even in that situation, I was doing the right thing, but I had the wrong heart. Nobody's fired up when somebody gives you flowers with a bad heart. And likewise, God's not fired up even when you do the right things, but with a bad attitude. You see, you got to do the right things with the right heart. You with me right here, guys? What are you doing? What are you doing? Look over in Jeremiah 17, verse 9. Jeremiah 17. You see, so often... We think that doing the right thing justifies having the wrong heart. Yeah, and we think that having the right heart justifies doing the wrong things. We could even be going to church that we know is wrong. We go, but yeah, but I'm, I just, I just want to love Jesus. But they're teaching all the wrong things. They're, they're not calling you to be a disciple. But yeah, I just really want to love Jesus. It's all about the heart, right? Well, let's look. Let's get a running start right here in Jeremiah 17, verse 5. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man and who draws strength from mere flesh and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert in a salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by water that sends out roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought. And never fails to bear fruit. Is that awesome? Amen. Well, look at this verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things. Whoa. Just, just follow your heart. Just, just go wherever your heart leads you. Just, just do whatever your heart 
says or whatever feels right. Well, what's the problem? Your heart is jacked up. It only led you into trouble in the past. I mean, what makes you think your heart's going to be any better now? And he goes, and it's beyond cure. I mean, nobody can fix that thing. Dude, you are really messed up. You have destroyed your heart beyond repair. Who can even understand it? It doesn't even make sense. And isn't that true? We don't even understand what we're feeling or what our heart's telling us. We're just like, one day I feel like this, and the other day I feel like that. But then it says in verse 10, I, Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. You see, God doesn't just examine the mind and neglect the heart. And he doesn't just examine the heart and neglect the mind. You see, so many people want to have just a heart relationship with God, an emotional relationship with God. When it feels good, you are good. How are you doing? Well, I feel like I'm doing really good. But, dude, I'm looking at your life, and it doesn't match the scriptures at all. But I feel like it's really good, so it's got to be good. Other people want to have a completely intellectual relationship with God. Well, I'm obeying the scriptures. Yeah, but you're an angry person. (laughs) But I'm doing what the Bible says, and I'm not angry. I mean, just, they want to have an intellectual relationship with God. But you see, God judges the heart and the mind. You've got to worship in spirit and in truth. What are you doing? What are you doing? Are you worshiping in spirit and in truth? Last point. What are you eating? What are you eating? That's a question I often ask Rich. Rich, what do you got there, bro? I mean, what kind of concoction is that, bro? What are you eating? This is also a question that my youngest son, Blake, often asks me. Daddy, what are you eating? Of course, that's never really what he wants to know. What he really wants to know is, hey, is, is that something sweet? And if it is, can I have some? For me, that gets into a lot of my, my issues. I've got issues. Amen, guys? I mean, we all got a little bit of issues. I got some baggage from before I became a disciple. I grew up in a family of four, but we didn't have much. And so mom would put food on the table, and if you weren't quick enough, you wouldn't get seconds. You with me? And that's why I always joke around about my brothers. My older brother's a little bit bigger than me, and my younger brother's a little bit smaller than me because he won first, and then I won second, and my, you know, large, medium, small. And so I think this led into a lot of my, what I call, eating complexes. You know, like some people like to mix their food on their plate. I hate that. I hate when it mixes on the plate. You've got to have it separate. You've got to have each of it for what it is. You with me? But what really drives me nuts is when people try to touch things on my plate. You with me right here, guys? I mean, I had to, I had to grow up protecting my food. Like, no, my brother's not going to touch my food. I got, I got my food. And so when somebody touches something on my plate, it goes right back to my child and go, whoa, where are you coming from? And I, it's, just, it's just frustrating. I hate it. When people touch things on my plate, even the people that I love. You know, early on in marriage, not to just vomit all my marriage issues up on everybody. She's not here to defend herself. <laughs> Pray for Kelly. Early on in our marriage, I, I don't forget, we went to McDonald's, and yes, I'll confess, we have gone to McDonald's once or twice. And uh, we're standing in line, and, and we're getting up to the cashier to order our food. And so she goes, okay, uh, sir, what do you want? And I, I went through my order. I want a supersized fries and a supersized burger and a supersized drink. And then I look over at my wife and go, babe, do you want something? She goes, nah, I think I'll probably just eat some of your fries. <laughs> Sisters, let's get real right here. I just want to help you guys out. Some of you younger sisters really want to get married, okay? I, I want to help you right here. If a brother orders super-sized fries, this is, this is not a joke. This is very serious. If a brother orders super-sized fries, brothers, the brothers are like, yeah, bro, preach it, bro. Amen. Come on, bro. It's because that brother wants to eat super-sized fries. He doesn't want to share. He doesn't want to give you one. He doesn't want to give you two. He doesn't want to give you what's left over. He wants to eat the whole dang thing. Uh, that's right, preach. That's right. So I get my food. 
And I'm sitting down to eat. Of course, my wife didn't order anything, but I told her, hey, if you want something, I'll, I'll buy it for you. No problem. Like, I'll buy you your own fries. No problem. She goes, no, nah, I'm okay. We sit down, and I start eating. Of course, you always eat the burger first because you got to save the fries for last, the best part. So I eat the burger, and my wife's just sitting there kind of hanging out, talking. And then all of a sudden, I pass the burger aside, and it's time to eat the fries. Well, just when I'm going in for my first fry, I see this rogue arm. No, she did. It, it, it was almost slow motion. This rogue arm passing in front of me, and I see my wife like, whoa, French fry. That's what I just got so ticked off. Why are you touching my French fries? I say all that just to say, people get a little sensitive about food. And so this might not seem as inappropriate as it seems to me. But to me, where Jesus is going right here seems very inappropriate. Let's go back to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, verse 27. You'll see where I'm going. It says, just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. You see, there he is. So inappropriate, Jesus. You're a rabbi. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Yeah, because Jesus, he never messed up. <laughs> see, it's always cool with Jesus. Sometimes it's appropriate to be inappropriate. <laughs> Verse 28. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, well, somebody brought him food? Or did he hit up a taco truck right here? Or what, what, what was it? Is there some poutine in the area we don't know about? My food, said Jesus is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Right. Don't you have a saying, still four months to the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and, and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one reaps, draws a wage, and harvests a crop for eternal life. So the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap, but you have not worked for it. I mean, you guys didn't even do anything. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. What are you eating? What are you eating? I mean, this just kind of seems a little rude. Jesus, you know, you're, you're, you're tired, you're hungry. I mean, you got to eat something. Because, guys, 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 look, man, I've got food that you know nothing about. Okay, uh, what, what are you talking about? He goes, look, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and finish his work. In other words, the thing that which sustains me is not the thing that sustains you. The thing that, that fills me up and, and really gets me fired up is not the same thing that fills you up and really gets you fired up. My food is to do what God sent me to do and to finish his work. What are you eating? What are you eating? Are you about what Jesus is about? Do you like the things that Jesus likes? Do you eat the food that Jesus eats? You know, it's interesting right here because Jesus goes on and he goes, guys, look. Open your eyes. And he tells them to look at something. Now, it's interesting because the geography right here at this well that they're at is that the well was outside the city of Sakaar, and in between the well and the city was this hill. And so a lot of scholars believe that as this woman would go back to Sakaar and start sharing with people, you gotta come. See the Messiah, he told me everything. The entire city is coming over this hill and walking down towards Jesus. And Jesus goes, guys, look. Look at all those people. The harvest is ripe. Open your eyes. You know, it's also interesting 
The word he uses right here for ripe in Greek is the word leukai, which I'm sure you guys all know what that means. It means white. What is that? In fact, some translations say the fields are white for harvest. White. Because in grain, when it gets overripe, it starts to turn this whitish color. So in other words, he's not saying that the fields are just ripe, like it's time to pick them. He goes, look, this, this is really ripe, as ripe as it gets. And if you don't hurry, these food is going to spoil. Wow. You know, the other day, I, I, I wanted to make some guacamole. <laughs> and so I went down to the, the local metro store, and I, I looked at the avocados, but they just weren't quite ripe. And you know, there's nothing worse than unripe avocados. Yeah. It's disgusting. Just hard and tasteless and gross, especially in guacamole. So I, I looked, and there was a different type of avocado that was like a Dominican Republic avocado. And these things were huge, like a spruce avocado or a bruce or something like that. It's just huge avocados. And I'd never, I'd never tasted this avocado, so I wasn't sure if it was the same thing. So I asked this lady that happened to be picking the avocado. I go, hey, are these very similar to these? Like, they taste the same? She goes, yeah. I go, okay, cool, because these are actually ripe. Those are not ripe. So I bought like five or six of them. And I brought them home, and I didn't know that, like, one of these avocados could make, like, a whole bowl of guacamole. So I got six of them. I was really hungry. And I started opening it up, and, and four of them were just ripe, perfectly white for the harvest. I mean, it's perfect. This is, like, soft and, and still green and not spoiled at all. But then I opened up two of them, and they were overripe. You know what avocados get over, right? They turn brownish. So you got brown avocado right out of the shell. And if you put that in the guacamole, what color is the guacamole going to be? Brown. Like brown. Like nobody wants to see brown guacamole. So I, I peel it back, and not only was it brown, but the texture had changed. It became hard and brown. It's just like gross and fibrous and just, oh, I just don't want to eat it. So I just chucked it right in the trash. You know, guys, I think Jesus right here, looking at these crowds, going, man, these guys are like those Bruce avocados. Not the, not the ones that are overripe, but those ones that are just perfect for the picking. Right. You know, I think, I think if Jesus was here right now in Toronto, he'd say the same thing. Mm. Guys, well, look around you. Yeah. Look at all these people. He said, I don't think Jesus cared who he was looking at. I don't think he cared if they were from Sakaar or Samaria or from Israel or Judah or Galilee or, or from Jamaica or from Zimbabwe or from Lagos, Nigeria or from Hawaii or from Africa. It doesn't matter. Jesus believed that when you see a group of people together, that group is ripe for the harvest. Don't wait four more months. The time is now. Amen. Let's keep reading. Verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So the Samaritans came to him. They urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. We now have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of Toronto. Well, that's, that's not what he says. We really know that Jesus is the Savior of Sakaar. No, that, that's not what he says. Jesus is the Savior of North America, no. the Middle East. No, the whole world. Right. And for these individuals, more importantly than even that, is Jesus was their Savior. You know, guys, I, I, I commend you in missions contribution. I don't want to give you the announcement yet, we still got some time before the official announcement. So I, I do want to keep you in suspense just a little longer. But I, I just want to say, church, you've done an incredible job with missions contribution. Of course, at the very beginning of this whole thing, the goal was 12 times our normal contribution. So that means take whatever you've given on a, a normal Sunday and multiply that by 12, and that's your goal. As a total, that came out to $14,000. And I was like, man, we, we take up a missions contribution every April. And last April, we took up a 25 times. I and mean, that was a lot. And now we're calling everybody to give a 12 times. I don't know how this is going to go. But Jake goes, bro, we, we could do it. I go, amen, bro. We're going to go with your faith. So we, we, we called everybody to give a 12 times missions contribution. 
And I got to say, this church has more than just embraced. I've been so impressed by just how not only you've done the right thing, but you've done it with the right heart. And uh, I'm excited to announce the total that we've got. But I just want to say, you have a heart. We have a heart for Jesus, not just to be the Savior of Toronto, but the Savior of the entire world. You know, guys, coming up here, we've got to bring your neighbor day. And I hope you're genuinely excited for International Sunday. It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun to see Jake dressed up like a cowboy and Tony dressed up like a, a Portuguese guy. I don't even know what that looks like. Vita dressed up like an Italian woman. And, and who knows, maybe Rich dressed up in a nice Chinese rice yeah. hat. Loga dressed up like a Cameroonian. Isaiah dressed up like a Nigerian, and Jody dressed up like a Jamaican, and Liz dressed up like a Mexican, and Kevin just dressed up like Kevin. Because <laughs> he's not really from the world. He's from another planet. We just don't know where he's from. But, you know, it's, it's going to be so much fun. But, guys, we really are about winning souls. The harvest is ripe. 59 people, just a small drop in the bucket to how many people cover the entire city of Toronto. And yet, all we're shooting for is 59 people. Harvest is even riper than that. But do you really believe it? I think sometimes we just don't believe that we can do great things. Do you really believe that where you open this scripture, no matter where it is, this scripture is true? You know, guys, we've also set the goal as a church that by the end of the year, we want to see six people come to a relationship with God. Is that awesome? They go, well, it's just a goal. No, it's not just a goal. These are people's souls. And we've got we've to pray for things. We've got to have things in our heart that we beg God for. Of course, God says, ask the Lord of the harvest. And I believe that God moves in people's lives. Ethiopian eunuch, he sent his angel. He sent the spirit of God. And then he sent his disciple. Amen. See, we get to be Jesus' disciple. We meet random people, but, but it's not really random, is it? Because God determines the times and the places. Amen. And God is moving in people's lives in ways we can't even see. I mean, who knows who had a near-death experience? Who knows who's struggling with alcoholism? Who knows who's struggling with depression and needs some help? Who knows who's really been fighting to know God and doesn't know where to go? Who knows? But God puts people in the right place at the right time. And if you are God's disciple and you just say the right thing, do the right thing, if you open your mouth, you can win these people for the Lord. Amen. And God willing, Lord willing, by the end of the year, we're going to see six new people come to the Lord through the water's baptism. <laughs> I was so inspired, even what Liz shared about her friend Hoodie. I don't remember, I don't think I could pronounce her real name, but she calls her Hoodie. Probably because she can't pronounce her real name either. Amen. <laughs> but, you know, she's just, she's been fasting for a relationship with God. And lo and behold, one day Liz just walks up. And says, hey, what's your name? I want to teach you about God. That's how God works. And when you're doing God's will, you can never say the inappropriate thing. Because sometimes it's appropriate to be inappropriate. This morning, I just want to ask ourselves, who are you with? Who are you with? Number two, what are you doing? Are you worshiping in spirit and in truth? And lastly, what are you eating? Does doing God's will fire you up? Does it sustain you? Does it encourage you? I mean, for me, when I eat a good hamburger, I'm fired up. <laughs> to do God's will is awesome. Guys, let's reflect upon these things as we take communion. Let's bow our heads in prayer.